Welcome to Sabbath School on It Is Written TV. I am John Bradshaw. Very blessed to be studying with you through this quarter's lesson quarterly, How to Interpret Scripture. I'll say up front, along with the lesson quarterly, you might want to get your hands on a copy of the companion book, How to Interpret Scripture, written by the lesson's authors. Numerous places you can get that. You can get a Kindle version at Amazon. Uh, one place you can very easily get this book is itiswritten.shop, or you could give us a call. Uh, the online store is open 24 hours a day, six days a week, and we'd be happy to help you if that's where you would like to find your copy. So this week, our lesson is entitled, Why is Interpretation Needed? I am being joined, as I said a moment ago, by the lesson's authors. Dr. Michael Hazel is a professor of religion of Near Eastern Studies at Southern Adventist University in Collegedale, Tennessee. He is also the director of Southern Adventist University's Archaeological Institute. Michael, thank you very much for being here. It's good to be with you, John. And joining us from Maryland uh, is Dr. Frank Hazel. Michael and Frank are cousins. Dr. Hazel is the associate director of the Biblical Research Institute at the General Conference headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland. Dr. Hazel, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, now let's look at this lesson. Why is interpretation needed? What a great question. We're talking about how to interpret Scripture. Let's get right down to the, to the, to the brass tacks here. Why is interpretation even needed? So we realize that when we come to the Bible, we say, what principles do we use to arrive at our understanding? It's really important that we get this nailed down. So, Michael, let me ask you this question. So people come with their presuppositions uh, and they are many. And if you're honest, then somewhere along the line in your Christian experience, your presupposition has met the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and you were given the opportunity at least to let that go. Uh, Dr. Michael Hazel, we've both met many people who love God, they believe the Bible, but they go through this process of learning that they brought some prejudices or presuppositions to the Bible that have now left them at odds with the Holy Spirit's direction. How do we get beyond that to a place of solid biblical uh, uh, interpretation, Michael? Well, I think our presuppositions definitely, we, we have them internally. Sometimes we're unaware of them, and that's why it's important when we focus on Scripture to examine what those presuppositions are. Um, you know, there are many different methods of biblical interpretation that have arisen over the years. Um, in the modern age, historical criticism has a very different set of presuppositions than the biblical presuppositions, uh, where you don't believe in uh, miracles, you don't believe in divine interaction, human affairs, you don't believe in uh, one-time events, you, you study the past based on what you can see and experience in the present, you you elevate your reason, your autonomous reason, to judge Scripture rather than allowing Scripture to influence and judge your life. It's a very different approach to Scripture. So here we find presuppositions that really deny the very foundation of what Scripture is trying to teach us, and yet this is the predominant way in which Scripture is being studied at most secular universities and even Christian universities today. So we need to be very careful when we approach Scripture that we do that on the basis of its own uh, set of, of presuppositions that it provides for us as well. Monday, we get into something I think is really very interesting, translation and interpretation. It reminds us that if you are reading, well, I think any Bible, you're reading it uh, in a language other than, than the original language. So somebody went to the ancient texts and interpreted them, that's what translating is, and restated them in another language. What are the ramifications of that? Well, the ramifications are that no language is going to be perfectly translated. It's already an interpretation when you, when you pick up an English Bible. There's already work of interpretation that has gone into that. And and, and certain words um, can be translated in, in several different ways in, in a breadth of semantic range that give it a, a great deal of power, really, and, and understanding. I think of the word chesed in Hebrew, 
which is the word for God's love towards humanity and towards his creation. And that is translated in so many different ways, loving kindness, mercy, uh, love, that you can't contain all of that in, in, a, in, a, in a translation. It, it's such a deep word. The word shalom is another word. So we have these words in the Bible that really um, we have to work very hard to, to arrive at a, good, at a good translation in order to, for us to understand the depth of meaning. We can do that, but that's where multiple uh, comparisons with maybe different translations can help us uh, look at the depth of meaning of that one word. Yeah, talk with me about that. Would you give any advice about translations, which ones to use, which ones not to use, which might not even be translations, as a matter of fact? There are many translations, particularly in the English language, and I like to compare them. I think that we should always try to go with a translation, an actual translation that is done by a committee, um, not by a paraphrase, for example, that is often one person's idea of what a text meant and, and paraphrasing that in very loose language uh, that goes further and further away from the original meaning of the text. Um, the translations that I like to read, um, I, I enjoy the New American Standard Bible. I enjoy the King James Version Bible. I like to preach out of the New King James Version Bible. These are, these are very good translations that are done with a whole a multitude of scholars that have worked together to, to look at the text and to arrive at meaning. But, but I have many, many translations at home. And as you said, online now, you can find these very easily and compare what these uh, various words and passages can be translated as. There's another question I want to ask you, Michael, and, and many people reading the lesson I go to say, I go to read this on, on Monday the Old Testament was written mostly in Hebrew with a few pages in Aramaic, while the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. And a number of people looked at that and said, I thought it was written in Greek. What is Koine Greek? Can you explain that? Well, we have classical Greek, which is the Greek of Homer and uh, Herodotus and some of the early writers. Um, but Koine Greek simply means the common language of Greek, which is what most of the New Testament was written in. Uh, these were not scholars that were writing for the most part. Paul was a scholar, and Luke was used very sophisticated language when he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. But for the most part, um, we, have, we have language that is being used uh, that is koine or common, the common Greek language, which was remarkable at that time because if you think about it, Greek was the universal language in that period of the Hellenistic Greco-Roman period, and so the Bible could be communicated and the message of Scripture could be communicated with a very large group of individuals very quickly as it was written. We want to encourage you to be studying the Bible, and I hope that the Sabbath School lessons are encouraging you to dig into the Word of God. It's a very important subject this quarter, how to interpret Scripture and learning how to interpret Scripture right will keep us focused and on the right path and keep us out of the ditches that are over on the left or on the right. It's Sabbath School with Dr. Michael Hazel and Dr. Frank Hazel. We'll be back with more in just a moment. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. Welcome back to Sabbath School on It Is Written TV. I'm John Bradshaw, joined by Dr. Michael Hazel and Dr. Frank Hazel, the authors of this quarter's Sabbath School Quarterly, How to Interpret Scripture. Our lesson this week is really a good one. Why is interpretation needed? Basic question, but a profound question. And we'll understand some of these aspects uh, that, that, that filter into this study. I think it's going to leave us in a better place to more clearly approach interpreting the Bible for ourselves. On Tuesday, I'll start with you, Dr. Michael Haas of the Bible and Culture. 
There's a question written here. How do different cultural backgrounds impact how we evaluate the importance of various ideas, the impact of culture on how we interpret the Bible? We all are part of different cultures. And so when we come to the biblical text, we many times bring with us those aspects of our upbringing, our families, our societies, uh, the things that we have uh, adopted and adapted ourselves to in our own culture. And then there is the culture of the Bible and when the Bible was written that also can impact our interpretation. So we have to be aware of both of those things. Uh, those of us who grew up in the Western world have maybe a more difficult time because the Bible is written in the Eastern world and has many concepts that are Eastern in terms of their its thinking. Psalm chapter 110 says, the Lord is speaking and he says, sit at my right hand till I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. If you were in a Middle Eastern culture, you would understand that the foot and the shoe, in, in fact, is the, is the dirtiest part of your body, and you never show that to anybody. It's offensive to cross your legs. It's offensive to show the bottom of your shoe to someone. Uh, that is still the case today. And we know through archaeology and excavating places like uh, King Tut's tomb in Egypt that he had multiple footstools for his thrones that were buried with him. And on those footstools were images of the enemies of Egypt. Every time he placed his feet on his footstool, he was subduing, literally as well as figuratively, his enemies, which were shown with their hands tied behind their backs under his feet in that footstool. So this became a, a real thing in the Egyptian mindset, and it continues today. Some years ago, President George W. Bush was in Iraq and holding a press conference after the Gulf War. And one of the uh, journalists there that was interviewing him took off his shoe. It was probably the closest weapon he had in, in hand since he went through security and threw it at the president. Well, that not only carried a message of infuriation at the president of the United States, but it also carried a message, I'm throwing at you the dirtiest part that I can throw at you, and it's an insult against you. So this still carries on today in Middle Eastern culture. And we remember that then President Bush famously clipped to the journalists. He said, and in case you were wondering, it was a size 10. Managed to duck out of the way. Dr. Frank Hazel, Wednesday is our sinful and fallen nature. So walk me through this very clearly, what we are, how we're made, what we've become maybe over millennia, impacts the way we in interpret the Bible. Walk us through this. Well, this is something that we often do not discuss when we talk about the interpretation of Scripture. We, we talk about technical things and methods and tools that help us to understand the Bible. But really, um, we need to be aware that uh, our sin also affects us in our understanding. And why is that? Because um, the Bible is not just a book that wants to be understood intellectually. The Bible is a book that wants to be embraced. The message of the Bible wants to be embraced and obeyed joyfully. And in order to obey something, we need to be willing to do it. And this is where we need the, the work of the Holy Spirit that helps us to be willing to see not only that we understand the words that are written, but that we are willing to accept them in our lives and to follow them uh, obediently. And uh, here I think pride is a big problem for anyone who wants to understand the Word of God. Why? Because pride doesn't need to learn. A proud person doesn't need to learn. A proud person knows. And therefore, there is no need to understand the Word of God even better and to submit to it and to learn from it humbly. And so pride is a sinful attitude that we all bring to the process of uh, reading the Bible and is challenged when we confront the Word of God or the, the Word of God confronts us. Most of us more than likely have experienced the, the, the conviction that comes when you're reading the Bible and God says, I'm speaking to you, I'm talking to you. And so 
maybe one thing that ought to be pointed out is the, the, the importance of studying the Bible with a surrendered heart, of coming to Bible study and saying, I figure you want to speak to me uh, about something, Lord. So when we read about gossip, we're not just saying, well, that's that other person over there, pride, it's that other person over there. Lord, speak to me because I am sinful and I am fallen. Uh, Dr. Frank Hazel, Thursday, why interpretation is important. Why don't you tell us? Why is interpretation important? Well, if that is the case, I mean, we've, we've seen we live in a different culture from the biblical culture. We, diff, we live in a different time. We speak a different language uh, than the biblical writers wrote uh, their message in. All this calls for interpretation. Why is interpretation important? Because the interpretation of Scripture has a direct effect on our theology, on our mission, on our spiritual life, on the way we follow God and we understand biblical truth. And for that reason, biblical interpretation is essential. It is a watershed uh, in, in theology. It is, it is not that we are saved by biblical interpretation, but without proper biblical interpretation, we would not know about the Savior uh, that the Word of God uh, presents to us. There, there's a beautiful statement that I would like to um, read here and quote, actually, um, from one of my favorite authors, Ellen White, and she has made a, a beautiful statement that we have uh, in the companion book that uh, you referred to. And she says, in your study of the word, lay at the door of your investigation your preconceived opinions and your hereditary and cultivated ideas. You will never reach the truth, she says, if you study the scriptures to vindicate your own ideas. Leave these at the door and with a contrite heart go to hear what the Lord has to say. And then she continues, do not read the word in the light of formal opinions, but with a mind free from prejudice, search it carefully and prayerfully. If, as you read, conviction comes and you see that your cherished opinions are not in harmony with the word, do not try to make the word fit these opinions. Make your opinions fit the word. I like that. We should not try to make the word fit my opinions. We should make my opinions fit the word of God. That's, that's, uh, that's extraordinary advice and very, very wise. One of the thought questions or discussion questions that we have, and we might have touched on it a moment ago, I think Michael did. How can a better understanding of the biblical times and culture help us better understand some passages of Scripture? So as you study, you might be a... a a white American or a black African or an Asian or a black American or a, a white South American. Uh, and, and yet fr from your vantage point in today's world, you're reading something that's thousands of years old. And what, what took place in the Bible all took place within a certain social, societal, cultural construct. So, so let's, let's, let's briefly -ish look at, um, how understanding those times might better inform you and help your interpretation of Scripture. Michael, do you have another example for us? When you look at the story of David and Goliath uh, that uh, took place in a very specific time in a very specific place on the border between Israel and Philistia, um, you, you, we often think of David, we often think of Goliath, we often think of the Israelites and the Philistines in a certain way. But... Um, I grew up thinking of Goliath, for example, as a huge kind of hairy big man that was a brute, um, not very intelligent perhaps, and was just out there with his brawn and muscle to, to fight against the Israelites and, and be victorious over them. But as we've studied through archaeology, both the Philistines and the Israelites, really culturally, when we look at their culture, um, the opposite is almost true. The Philistines were the sophisticated city folk who had the most beautiful pottery, who had the most beautiful uh, temples and buildings, 
who had the most incredible technology. The Israelites, the Bible tells us, in fact, had to go down and sharpen their tools and their, their weapons with the Philistines, which is a very awkward situation to be in. I think as we've studied these cultures archaeologically over the last you know, 30, 40, 50 years, we understand much more about them. We, we can understand now why Samson was drawn to go down to the Philistines in a maybe different light than, than we did before. And we can see that the challenges that Israel had as a agrarian agricultural people living in the highlands uh, and being tempted by the allure of the cities and allure of, of this sophisticated culture from the Greek world, that you know we, we face the same kinds of temptations today. Uh, and we face the same kinds of, of uh, issues today many times that, that they face then. And, and those kinds of connection points, I think, can be very interesting. Frank, can you give us an example of something you can think of, uh, you, you understand, that helps us understand the Scriptures better when we better appreciate the Bible times, the Bible culture, knowing that influences our interpretation? Perhaps one, one illustration that comes to my mind is... Um, is the eating that is presented in, in Bible times and the table fellowship. Now, we might be uh, used to eat with uh, people here and there or alone, but we need to understand that in biblical times, when a person was invited to eat at your table, it was a sign of friendship, of respect. You would never, ever um, put the knife into the back of a person who was sitting at your table having table fellowship with you. So it was a sign of, of, of friendship, of trust, of, of, of being united with that person, a part of the family, so to speak. And uh, when, we, when we have that background, then uh, the invitation that Jesus uh, ha has in the New Testament or in the last book uh, where we, we, we see about the table fellowship that God wants to have with us in the New Jerusalem gains a, a deeper meaning and a significance because it shows that God really wants to, to be close to us and wants to be our friend and wants to be see us uh, as part of his family. There's a question that I don't want to miss. It's an extraordinarily important question, I believe. It's at the end of Thursday's section. We're encouraged to read the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who may. Worship the creator. Second angel, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Third angel, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark and his forehead in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That's the... A very quick run through there. Here's the question. What are the theological issues here and why is a correct understanding of them so important to our mission? Thursday, why interpretation is important. But you get to the end of Thursday and we really focus in here on something profoundly important. Why is a correct understanding of the three angles messages of Revelation chapter 14 so important to our mission. Michael, let me start with you. Well, let me start with the first angel, perhaps, and just say I don't think it's a coincidence that since um, 1844 and the publication of two major books uh, highlighting Oswald Chambers and Charles Darwin, uh, highlighting the principles and proposing the principles of evolution for the first time, I don't think it's a coincidence that when you see this first angel crying out, declaring God as the creator, and quoting actually from the fourth commandment, almost verbatim, it calls us to uphold God who is the creator of all things, and who created the seventh day Sabbath. These are things that we are called to highlight in the time in which we live, and to me, it makes it even more relevant. Dr. Frank Hassel, what would you add here? Why, what are the theological issues in the Three Angels and Messages? Why is a correct understanding of them so important to our mission? It is, it is so important for a number of reasons. You see, you cannot understand the message of the three angels in the book of Revelation 
if you don't have a knowledge of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Because Daniel and Revelation go together and you need to understand the biblical principles of prophetic interpretation. We will, we will deal with prophetic interpretation a little later uh, in this quarter. But it requires that you have um, an understanding of how to arrive at biblical prophecy and the understanding of biblical prophecy that leads us to the end times uh, where God has a special message for uh, his last church and to warn the, uh, the, the people of this earth of his soon coming. And, and in biblical prophecy, this is connected with uh, specific dates. Not that we can predict the second coming of Jesus, but um, dates that uh, are in line with biblical prophecy in the book of Daniel and other things in, in the book of Revelation. With the three angels' message, it's not just the messages of the three angels. It's how you arrive at that a message uh, because you connect it to biblical prophecy. That's why it is so important and why we need interpretation. There's a real reason why many people have lost sight of what the church's mission actually is in this last day of earth's history. There's an increasing emphasis on a social gospel. There's an increasing emphasis on uh, a fellowship gospel. There's an increasing emphasis on a very... Uh, I hope you understand what I mean, a very vanilla version of Christianity. Instead of a version of Christianity, a message that's distinct, that's pointed, that serves a purpose, uh, we're going to get away from our mission given us by God of being a, a clarion call, a clear voice to the world to prepare to meet Jesus when he comes back and comes back soon. If we aren't understanding how to interpret the Bible, if we're getting bogged down by our presuppositions and our cultural ideas and our prejudices of this or that, we'll read Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 through 12 as just another delightful passage of Scripture. And we won't come away from that saying, God has set me on fire to go forward to share this message with the world so that God himself can call out a remnant who will be ready to be sealed with the seal of God rather than being marked with the mark of the beast in preparation for the soon return of Jesus interpretation is that important and so much more i want to thank you for joining me and us as a matter of fact and i want to thank some of us i'd like to thank dr michael hazel from southern adventist university for being with us this week dr hazel thank you so much great to be with you and i want to thank dr frank hazel from the biblical research institute of the general conference in silver spring maryland it's really good having you here thank you for your time look forward to seeing you again for more sabbath school here on it is written TV.